Okay, so let's go to the carbon first, and then we'll come back to this question. Okay, the carbon system, unlike the oxygen system, is a little more complicated, as you can imagine. And I call this the graduate student survival guide for understanding CO2 and aquatic systems. If you haven't seen this book, go to Amazon and buy it, all right? You're living the carbon problem. If you're working in freshwater systems, you're working marine systems, you're working with rainwater, you have to be able to do the carbon equilibria. Okay, you can't get away from it. And if you understand this at a fundamental level so you can talk it and think it in your head, you are so far ahead of your colleagues that are trying to get jobs, I can't tell you. So this is a great book on this by Richard Zevi. By the way, he's at University of Hawaii now, and uh, he wrote this book as a postdoc. So it was a tour de force. All right, so let's talk about the CO2 system in the ocean. This is inorganic carbon. Okay, so what do we know? We know that atmospheric PCO2, okay, is related to the aqueous CO2 in the ocean, okay, through Henry's law. It's a very simple law. If you're a scuba diver, you have to know Henry's law. It's the law of partial pressures, all right? And this relationship is effectively PCO2 is equal to aqueous CO2 in the ocean divided by Henry's law constant, a temperature-dependent constant. If you increase or decrease the CO2 in the ocean, you increase and decrease the CO2 in the atmosphere. It's that simple. And that's the way the Earth's operated pretty much for the last 50 million years. It doesn't operate that way now. Now we have, you can see from these fluxes, we have a problem. We're pumping CO2 into the atmosphere and the ocean's trying to compensate by absorbing it. All right? And by the way, that's your ocean acidification problem. What happens is when this CO2 dissolves in the ocean, Okay, it's going to dissociate or it's going to produce carbonic acid. Okay, CO2 plus water makes carbonic acid, and it dissociates a proton to make bicarbonate, and it can dissociate another proton to make carbonate. That 2H is really one of these. Okay? So in effect, the inorganic carbon system is the dynamic buffer that we have in, on planet Earth to help ameliorate the rapid rise of CO2 in the atmosphere. CO2 goes up in the atmosphere, and a lot of it dissolves in the ocean. And right now, that number is in the close to 50% of the CO2 we pump out goes in the ocean. And of course, what's happening is you do that, okay, that CO2 goes in in carbonic acid, and we start to involve the rest of the inorganic carbon buffering system. So when you take a look at this system, and you look at CO2 in water to make carbonic acid, bicarbonate and carbonate, what you're also dealing with now is parts of the biological system. Because phytoplankton want to use carbonic acid. They want to use CO2 for photosynthesis. And marine calcifiers like corals and pteropods and foraminifera want to use carbonate to make their skeletons. Okay, they're calcium carbonate skeletons. And this normally is a very, very nice relationship of taking down CO2 by photosynthesis and taking out carbonate by calcium calcification, and the ocean and the planet's happy. The ocean and the planet's not happy right now, okay? Why isn't it happy? Because of this. This is what's called a Bjorn plot. Okay, this is now a, you can, you can do this with basic carbon equilibria. It's a very simple Excel spreadsheet plot to make. And what you're looking at is the relative proportions of CO2 aqueous carbonic acid, usually these two are combined, bicarbonate and carbonate as a function of pH. Okay. And as the pH increases, so it moves to the right, what's happening is carbonate is increasing, carbonic acid is decreasing, and bicarbonate doesn't change all that much in, in the seawater pH range, okay, because you're sort of in that really nice buffering range where bicarbonate is the big carbon reservoir, inorganic carbon reservoir in the ocean. But as you add CO2, and you increase that amount, what you're doing is you're effectively titrating out carbonate to make bicarbonate. So as CO2 goes up, carbonate goes down. And there's where the problem is for calcifiers. Okay. When we look at this in carbon isotope space, we really have two big areas that can control the delta C13 of this dissolved inorganic carbon in the ocean. The first is a temperature-dependent equilibrium between the atmosphere 
and the inorganic carbon in the ocean. And this is uh, a couple of really, really nice uh, papers that were uh, produced by uh, Zhang and Le Jean Lynch Stiglitz in 1995. Uh, I recommend if you're interested in this, these are great papers to look at. And you can see that as a function of temperature, what you find is that if this is the delta C13, this is fractionation relative to the atmosphere. So you find that total CO2, which is carbonic acid, bicarbonate, and carbonate combined, total carbon, total inorganic carbon. Okay, and effectively what we see is a temperature dependent fractionation such that when it gets colder, okay, you have a greater fractionation between the CO2 and the inorganic carbon that's in seawater. And the combined, the three forms combined give you something on the order of about an 11 per mil fractionation between the atmosphere and the ocean. The ocean has a delta C13 that's enriched in C13 relative to the atmosphere. And as you get out to tropical temperatures, that fractionation drops off. And uh, you can see that carbonate and bicarbonate are affected by this, but carbonic acid really isn't. There's, a, there's not a temperature-dependent fractionation on that. But think of it as the carbonic acid, that CO2, is only 1 to 2 percent of the inorganic carbon in the ocean. 98 to 99 percent is in the form of bicarbonate and carbonate. So they control the total CO2. What this does, in absence of any other process, today would be to take, this is the atmospheric delta C13 today, it's about minus 8.5 per mil. Okay, so what it would do is say that the delta C13 of the ocean should range at the surface between about minus 0.8 and something like 2.2 per mil. Okay, depending on where you are in the temperature of the ocean, if, if the ocean was in equilibrium with the atmosphere. But there is another process that has a dramatic effect on the delta C13 of the inorganic carbon, and that's the biological system. Now, the biological system involves primarily your photosynthetic organisms and your organisms that are consumers, that respire CO2. In surface waters in most places, in the gyres, okay, outside of upwelling zones, we'll get to upwelling zones a little bit later, what we find is that your, phyto, your phytoplankton are operating like pretty much like C3 plants. And they're fractionating the CO2 that they're using for photosynthesis to the tune of about 20 to 25 per mil. So the delta C13 of organic matter that's produced in the surface ocean is around minus 20 per mil. So if phytoplankton use up all the nutrients that they have available to them, basically that's pretty much what controls them, all right, then what they have done is effectively removed a huge amount of carbon-12 O2, so what's left behind in the water is inorganic carbon that's enriched in C13. So what we find in the surface photic zone is that the delta C13 of the inorganic carbon is enriched in C13. It's shifted in a positive direction relative to that equilibrium effect that we just talked about. Yeah? Hi, just a quick question. So that delta C13 is just the DIC? The DIC. That's the DIC. Yeah, right. Okay. As we move down below the photic zone, okay, we shift from a photosynthesis dominated environment to respiration dominated environment. Okay. Everybody's eating the stuff that's falling from the surface because that's effectively the source of their, their nutrient, their, their, their energy. And there's that old adage you've heard probably many times, you are what you eat, plus or minus a couple per mil. Okay. So what your fish and what your microbial communities respiring is CO2 that reflects more the source carbon, the organic carbon, hence they're releasing CO2 that's depleted in delta C13 relative to the inorganic carbon that's in the water because they're basically metabolizing this organic matter and that shifts the delta C13 in a negative direction. So you get these beautiful profiles as you move down through the ocean, as you'll see in a second, related to photosynthesis and respiration. But obviously things are not as simple as that, and we'll, have, we'll come back to this in a few minutes, because when you take a look across the surface ocean, and now this is something that was pre-1980 this was taken, so the numbers aren't valid today. All the numbers are lower today than they are on the y-axis. You can see that we have high values up here. We have really low values sitting at the equator. There's a lot of variability, okay? And we'll come back to why that variability at the surface ocean. 
But let's take a look deeper in the ocean. So what this plot is showing you is the North Pacific. It's a data set showing you in the, in the blue dots, it's showing you the delta C13 of DIC. And you can see that the delta C13 of inorganic carbon is high at the surface and progressively gets lower as you move down through the water column, such that by the time in the North Pacific you hit about 500 to 600 meters, you have the lowest delta C13 DIC or total CO2 values you see pretty much in the ocean. Okay, you're getting values out here that are minus a half per mil thereabouts. What you're looking at is photosynthesis and now respiration. What's interesting is this plot because this is phosphate. And if I showed nitrate, it would look very similar, but phosphate, for a variety of reasons, is the better one to show. What you see at the surface is phosphate's very low. Phytoplankton have drawn down the nutrients at the surface so that they're very low at the surface. And then as you move down in the water column, those nutrients increase dramatically such that they're at their maximum when the delta C13 is at its lowest. And if you plot this data up, what you find is this great relationship between delta C13 DIC and nutrients. Okay, so we wind up with this really good delta C13 phosphate relationship. And why does this relationship exist? It exists because in the ocean, unlike terrestrial environments, Okay, the carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus ratio of marine systems or marine organisms tends to be relatively constant. And we call this the redfield ratio. It's about 106 unit, uh, atoms of carbon to 16 of nitrogen to one of phosphorus. Right, and obviously this 106 to one right here, okay, is why we have this 1.1 per mil, 1% okay, per micromole, car, uh, micromole phosphate. Right, so, Organisms that are metabolized, that are, that are eaten and broken down, organisms are excreting phosphate and they're respiring CO2 in proportion to their food sources. Okay, hence we see this really, really nice relationship. Now back to the question that was just asked a second ago. So we have this change of depth, you know, if you look at phosphate, okay, here's, um, here's this actual uh, drop off of phosphate in the deep ocean. Okay, but when you go to the Atlantic, you see something completely different. Number one, you see much, much lower nutrient concentrations in the Atlantic than do the Pacific. And pretty much once you hit this sort of 800 meter range where you have sort of these maxima, things are pretty constant all the way to the bottom, unlike the Pacific. If you look at oxygen, you see a very similar type of effect. The Pacific, okay, which is in open circles, okay, gets a really low oxygen concentrations at this depth. This is called the oxygen minimum zone of the ocean, sitting at about 500 to 1,000 meters. And then the oxygen levels sort of start to increase. Now, where does the ocean get replenished with oxygen? The only place the ocean can possibly get replenished with oxygen, at the surface. The atmosphere is the big reservoir of oxygen on our planet, okay? So when you take a look at this, it's, a, it's something that you really need to keep in the back of your mind as you go through your research. What you're looking at is a static picture of a dynamic process, okay? So what you see is surface, midwater, deep, and you're wondering, how does the oxygen get from high at the surface? How does it get down here if you have a low here? Okay, you're not thinking in three dimensions, actually four dimensions, which is what you need to think about whenever you're working with these problems, all right? You have a three-dimensional world that operates with time. Okay, this is not a two-dimensional problem, it's a four-dimensional problem. And that's where the mind has to now embrace the big picture. It's really important to do this because it'll change your whole perspective of how to interpret data. Okay, so let's figure out how we solve this problem and how we link everything up to solve the problem that the Atlantic is saltier than the Pacific. And to do this, I'm going to quickly go through this. All right, we got to link up the deep ocean currents with the surface currents. There are two two deep ocean currents today. Okay, one of them's in the North Atlantic. It sits south of Greenland. 
And this is a current that basically starts with a mass of water near the surface and it sinks into the deep Atlantic. A source of that current turns out to be waters that come up as a surface water mass with the Gulf Stream and make it up into the Norwegian Sea and also up into the Labrador Sea over here around Greenland where those waters cool. Now when waters cool, and this is again a, something that's counterintuitive, when waters cool, they don't cool by conduction. If you have cold, warm water at the surface and you want to cool it, you don't cool it by giving off heat. How do you cool it? What do you have to give off? Come on, basic oceanography. How, many, how much energy do you lose by cooling one gram of water one degree Celsius? One calorie, okay? One calorie. How much energy do you take out of the ocean if you take one gram of water and you evaporate it? Okay, it turns out, well, to evaporate water, if you want to conceptually think of it, you have to take it from whatever the water temperature is, let's say it's 10 degrees C, to 100 degrees C, you have to get it up so that liquid can go to vapor, so that's 90 calories. Then you have to move it from the liquid to the vapor state, which is the latent heat of evaporation, that's 540 calories. So to take one gram of water and turn it into water vapor, you're effectively taking 600 plus calories of energy out of the surface ocean to move that water vapor into the atmosphere. When that water vapor precipitates, you've just added energy to the atmosphere and you've pulled it out of the ocean. It's water vapor evaporating off the ocean that's the primary heat transfer mechanism to the atmosphere. It's not heat conduction warming the atmosphere. And this is why, with the westerlies blowing across like this, the ocean, why northern Europe's so warm. It's not warm because the air warms up because it's blowing across the ocean. It's warm because the air absorbs all this water vapor, all right, which now has a huge amount of energy. And when that precipitates, that energy goes into the, into the atmosphere as the water changes back from vapor to liquid. So what we get are winds blowing across the ocean, picking up water vapor for northern Europe, and it cools the ocean. And in the Norwegian Sea, what we have is a surface flow coming out of the North Atlantic into this deep basin. Here's Greenland over here. Here's Iceland. Here's the British Isles. At the surface, losing heat. Okay, the cold water builds up in the Norwegian Sea, and then as it builds up, it spills over the sill and down into the deep Atlantic. So you wind up with this deep ocean current that's sitting at about four degrees Celsius and makes, starts making its way down into the South Atlantic, okay? Taking really salty water from our gyre down into the deep ocean.